Good morning. Good morning. We are so happy that you're here, whether you are here in person or whether you're joining us online. Um, welcome. We hope that you feel welcome. We hope that you feel uh, the presence of the Lord here. And you look great here in, in our temporary sanctuary. You look wonderful. So, so very glad that you made it out. There are a couple of announcements that um, I just want to call your attention to. The first one is that this Saturday, the 27th of August, we're going to have a back-to-school bash for Bible Center children and children um, in our after-school programs. And so that is going to be this Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. It'll be outside um, near the playground area. And so if you need information about that, um, you can see me, but you can always, any of these announcements, you can always go to BC pgh.info and there will be details about um, anything that's happening. Um, we're going to have a baby shower on the uh, 17th of September and so want to put that on your uh, calendar as well. Eric and Teresa Cargo are expecting a beautiful baby girl and so we want to shower her with lots of blessings. And so um, September 11th is Grandparent Sunday. want you to invite your grandparents. We're going to have a very special um, day on that Sunday. And October 1st we have a breakfast and a resource fair for our seniors. So lots of things going on at Bible Center. And again, you can always stay connected uh, by going to bcpgh.info to find out uh, the things that are happening. But we have a very special, we're going to enter into, um, it's really a three-part training. We're going to focus on relationship building. And so building relationships, not only with Bible Center in the community, but building relationships within the congregation. There are people that maybe every Sunday you sit next to or near and you really don't know much about them. And I think, you know, if I think back to, you know, years in school, I don't know that after probably first grade, anyone teaches us how to make friends or how to connect at a deeper level. But we're going to do some of that work because we just feel like it's important. It's important as this faith community, but it's also important as we learn how to minister to our community. So there's a quick video. I'm just going to uh, call your attention to the screen, and we're going to watch that for about a minute or two. Bible Center has been in the community of Homewood since 1956. The church was established here to meet the needs of the people who live, learn, work, play, and worship here. In our 66 years, we have worked to help the community thrive through various ministries. These include residential homes for the elderly, a coffee shop, an urban farm, a business academy, and many educational programs for youth. As we enter this next phase of ministry, we want to focus on strengthening the relationship between our church and the community. We want to develop the necessary skills to have authentic relationships with one another and to connect with our neighbors. We want to create opportunities for people and organizations in the community to engage with Bible Center in meaningful ways. We want to develop the heart of Christ so that we can respond to those around us who may be isolated or hurting. Our plan is to develop a holistic blueprint for ministry that helps individuals thrive, our church to flourish, and our community to be more like heaven. On Tuesday, August 23rd, we will engage in an initial training followed by a congregational gifts assessment in early September. We will have a workshop on September 24th and will then begin the process of self-discovery and community listening. The information we gather will be used to plan for the next phase of our ministry with the community. We believe that building relationships is central to what God has called us to be and do, and we are excited about all that God has in store for Bible Center and Homewood. We encourage you to join us for this journey. Amen, amen. So again, very excited about that. And so we're going to pray for our children now. We're going to ask that Sister Alberta would come. She's going to pray, but we're also going to pray for teachers. And so whether there are teachers here with us, but um, we know that the teachers in the Pittsburgh Public School are headed back to, um, to school on tomorrow. And so we just want to pray for the kids and the teachers that they have an amazing year. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. All those with children that are here present in the building, grab a hold to your children, their hands. All those watching online, bring your children close to you. 
We're going to pray. Thank you, Father God, this morning for allowing us to share in these precious gifts that you have given us children only by you. They are formed in the womb, Father, and you know them before they are formed. And as they are given to the parents, the guardians, foster parents, adoptive parents, we say thank you for these children. And Father God, we want the best for these children because you want the best for these children. And Father God, we want them to grow up and be all that you have called them to be, more than what they could think or imagine, Father. Father God, we pray a, a specific and an ever-present prayer for these children as some of them go off to school starting this week, next week, Father. We ask for a hedge of protection, Father, on all the children, Father, the ones who are in school and not have started school yet, a hedge of your protection around them, Father. We ask, Father God, that they will be fearless, fearless to walk and talk and be all that you have called them to be. Bless their minds to be open, Father, to all that they will be learning and finding out and exploring, Father. Bless their hearts to be like sponges to absorb all that they are learning, Father. The tablets of their hearts to be penetrated with studies and, and uh, nourishment, Father, your nourishment, Father in the name of Jesus. I pray for the parents, the guardians, the foster parents, the adoptive parents that are overseeing these children. Provide all that the households need, Father. Monies, Father, things, everything that they need, clothing. Father God, you can do it all. With, with you, all things are possible. You are the provider, Father. Bless their health, Father, any special needs child, Father. Bless them with all that they need to be able to attend school, Father, and be with their peer, their, their, their spheres, Father, with their peers, Father, in the name of Jesus. Bless all that they need in the name of Jesus. And Father God, we bring each and every educator unto you this morning, Father teachers, Father, administrators, <clears throat> food service workers, custodians, all that will be working in the schools with these children, Father. We want the schools to be safe, and we're asking in Jesus' name that you provide safety to these schools, Father, in the name of Jesus. No type of uh, invasion of the enemy in the name of Jesus, Father. Bless the educators to be able and ready to support and encourage and to teach these children, Father. You said, train up the child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they shall not depart. We are all training these children up. We can do our part, the part that you have given us, Father. Anytime we come into the presence of a child, you want us to do our part, Father. Bless the schools with all that they need, supplies, monies, things, people, in the name of Jesus. We know there's a shortage of teachers, Father, but with you, you can provide all that is needed, Father. So we're asking all that is needed for these schools to be provided. In the name of Jesus. And Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we can come unto you and pray and ask and seek and knock. And you are right there listening, waiting for us to come unto you in yes. prayer. So Father, we ask all of these things. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for all of us, we ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Praise God. continue. Thank you for your faithful giving and investment in the work of the ministry. We have multiple ways to give here at Bible Center. We appreciate your faithfulness and of course uh, we pray for God's wisdom to invest and utilize those resources in a way that's aligned with his purpose and his calling. And so uh, again, thank you for your giving and uh, you'll be able to either if you're giving in-house, you can give to one of the deacons at the rear or otherwise you can give online or however you choose to do that. But we thank you for that. We want to resume. So pre-pandemic, as you know, we would always pray for the children. We would anoint them. And so um, we want to resume that. I think it's important that we lay hands on the babies. Amen. Amen. And so before they get released to Children's Church and all of that, we'll, we'll do that. Amen. All right. Children's Church today. All right. So the babies can be dismissed to a better place if they so desire. Um, we're excited this morning to welcome the Pollards to the family. Amen. Praise God. Ask them to, to come as we do the covenant. Amen. Everybody, everybody signed it, the whole family. <laughs> so we have to put the covenant up on the screen for us to share with them as well. I guess I should have did certificates for the babies too. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly slipping already all right the expectation of membership number one i will protect the unity of my church we're gonna do this together amen. amen i will protect the unity of my church by acting in love toward other members by refusing to gossip by following the leaders i will share the responsibility of my church by praying for its health and growth by inviting the unchurched to attend by warmly welcoming those who visit I will serve the ministry of my church by discovering my gifts and talents, by being equipped to serve by my pastor and other leaders, by developing a servant's heart. I will support the testimony of my church by attending faithfully, by living a godly life, by giving regularly. And finally, I will live the mission of my church. We love God, we love people, and we live like Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the family. Thank you. Put that up on your wall next to your diploma, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> God bless. Amen. 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 Please make sure that you welcome them after service. Amen. And folks are heading out the, uh, in the back if they desire to go. All right. <laughs> I want to go with the children. Listen. Listen, you got... I do want to take a minute. Uh, Howard Aaron Potter, who was our soprano this morning, <laughs> was in the hospital. Her husband um, was having chest pains and so forth. And so I spoke with her shortly, uh, not too long ago. And so just want to take a second to pray for her, pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanksgiving, Lord God. We pray for Aaron, we pray for Howard, we pray for the whole family. Lord God, we thank you that the report is good, Lord God, that he did not have a heart attack. But as they're testing and trying to figure it out, Lord God, I ask that you give them wisdom, give them knowledge, insight, and understanding. So, Father, I just pray for your, their strength, Lord God. I ask that you be with Aaron, Lord God. Remove all fear and concern. Let her know that you are still in control, yes, that you are yes. still God. Even as we were talking about the 23rd Psalm this morning, Lord God, we hear that your presence is with us. No matter what we go through, you're there. And so for that, God, we give you thanks. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We pray this prayer in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. You guys need to give yourself some love this morning. Kudos, because these are the truly saved people who came out today. Because I was like, if I didn't have to preach today, I'd have been online myself. The animals was tearing up. I saw the dogs and the cats walking down the street. I was like, good Lord, it's raining outside. But y'all came on, got up. I rolled over. I was like, babe, we going today? She's like, you preaching, bro. You got to go. I was like, that's right. All right. All right. All right. So kudos to the in-house folks. But of course, we love those of you who are online as well. So August, as you know, is National Black Business Month. Maybe you didn't know that. But August is Black, National Black Business Month. This is important because as we know, unfortunately, the history of our people in this country often denied opportunity to use our gifts, our talents, and our abilities in our day jobs. Amen. Right, so you have people who are tremendously talented, gifted, able to do all kinds of things, but because either denied access to educational opportunity, because we couldn't afford 
didn't have the resources to go to school, simply because we were boxed out, even in terms of the union. So it didn't matter what type of job, we always found ourselves kind of on the outs. And so of necessity, many of us had to create and build businesses. We continue to do that work. Let me see, matter of fact, how many of you have a business? Let me see. So we have uh, probably about half of the people in the room. How many of you had a business? Okay, that's the, uh, that was the other half. <laughs> uh, how many of y'all got a business, but you don't want the man to know, so we just gonna keep, uh, just wink at me. I, got, I understand trying to keep saying out your pocket. That's what's up. Anyway, <laughs> we're about 90% of these people in here in business one way, shape, or the other, right? That's a big deal, but of necessity, I think about my dad, I think about my grandfather, I think about my grandmother, right? Seamstress, cook food took care of folks, all kinds of things that we do to be productive. But unfortunately, again, we're often denied. And so it is important that I think that we take advantage of celebrating business, but more importantly, in our own work, we seek to build businesses. And so this is a picture of cohort eight, famous cohort eight. Each cohort believes that they're the best cohort. And of course, I tell them, you're the best cohort. That last cohort was all right, but y'all are the best. And so then cohort nine, which was the best after cohort eight, they were the best ones. After eight, nine were clearly the best ones, right? And we had folks both here in Pennsylvania, also in uh, different states. But the opportunity to see people use the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that God has placed in them and to create business, create opportunities for jobs, transform communities. It's such a powerful thing. So this is on every Tuesday from six to nine after work. Right, get to work 6.37, come home 6 to 9, but excited about it. When, when you see the transformation that happens, when people can take an idea from their head, you realize that all of that comes from the Lord. Amen. Right, our gifts, our talents, ability. Brother Tony talked a couple weeks ago and talked about the guy Bezalel, I think it was his name. God puts in people the ability to craft. In this case, this guy was doing the um, decoration of the temple. But if you've ever seen somebody like take a piece of wood and just start hacking on stuff, and the next thing you know, there's a flower or there's an animal or something. It's just unbelievable. Somebody, I don't know about you, like cooking is a deep for me. How you get everything done at the same time so we all ready to eat, it's the craziest thing in the world. That's a gift, you know what I'm saying? I'm a one thing at a time type dude, you know what I'm saying? Y'all go ahead and have that first course because I didn't figure out how to get the rest of it here at the same time, <laughs> right? But the fact there are people who know how to do a whole meal and everybody eats and the stuff is hot is the craziest thing in the world. I go to restaurants that can't figure that out, right? And so the fact that God has placed in people the ability, what I find is the greatest thing that we offer really is confidence. Because unfortunately, so many of us don't know who we are. You remember, what, what was the vocabulary word I gave you last week? You remember? Alisophobia. Alisophobia. What does it mean? Okay, you go online. I'll see you. What is alisophobia? Fear of other people's opinion. Worried about what people think of us. And we find that one of the greatest challenges when we're trying to help people build their businesses is concern about what other people will think. But when we realize who we are and who God created us to be, and that's what we're going to talk about today, then our fear goes away. And we can encourage and give each other confidence. So I have a, a testimony from one of my favorite entrepreneurs, uh, Brother Darren Ward. And so I'll ask that he go ahead and uh, share that video where Darren gives just a little piece of his testimony. Hi, my name is Darren Ward, and I am the owner of D. Ward Design. And my plan was, at the time, I was working a job that I absolutely hated. So my plan was to go back to school and get my degree. And after that, look out world, here I come. Like the world was gonna be my oyster. So 2015, um, I graduated and I'm thinking it's on. It's on from here. So I, I graduate and like a, a, a month later, nothing three months later nothing um, six months later nothing so i began to uh sort of go into a depression again like you know that wasn't this this is not the plan like my plan was to get the degree and get the killer job and and and, and take off from there um but god 
begin to speak to me again, like my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Um, they're so far, so far above your ways and your thoughts. So don't rely on me, rely on God. So I'm praying one morning and as I'm, I'm praying, God began to speak to me about uh, preparing to leave my job. So I began to do just that. I began to uh, focus on my, my, my freelancing and, and the, the few clients that I had and uh, building relationships. So I'm, I'm listening to a sermon one day and um, the pastor is uh, taking his topic from uh, Thessalonians where uh, Paul is speaking to the church and he says, may God give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith inspires you to do. And that spoke to me because he was, he was saying that a lot of times God doesn't tell us what to do. He puts, us, he puts it within us. So it, it, and it's about your faith being moved enough to act upon it. And I stepped out on faith and about six months after I, I left my job, of 20 years, <laughs> um, COVID hit and things begin to shut down. So I'm preparing myself for uh, what's to come, what I thought was to come. And maybe I would get a job somewhere or something like that. And I'm like, man, I can't believe like I, I finally stepped out on faith and, and now this is, this is how it's going to end. Um, but God began to move during that time and business took my business took off um, my clients doubled almost tripled and he just began to move in a way that I didn't think was even possible um, just showing me that if you put your trust in me then I'll take you where no man can take you so I'm a witness that God uses um, ordinary people to do ordinary extraordinary things um, like I said I, I'm the first in my family to even go to school, um, go to college, and to graduate from college. Um, I never thought, I never saw myself owning my own business, um, but yet here I am today, and I have no one to thank but God, and to God be the glory um, for all the things that he has done. So, like I said, I'm a witness. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The drummer is a sad, sad dude. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we give you thanks for today. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your son. I thank you for this opportunity to be together as family. God, I ask that you would word my mouth. Give me to speak, Lord God, with power, with critical clarity and precision, Father, that we will receive and understand the message that you set forth for today. I thank you for this topic. Thank you for our time that we've been talking about this idea of being extraordinary. And so, God, again, use me as your vessel to motivate, encourage, and inspire your people to be who you've created and called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So for the last probably six weeks, we've been talking about this idea of extraordinary. And we've talked about a bunch of different people in the Bible, right? We talked about Deborah. We talked about Boaz. We talked about Miriam. We talked about Gideon. We talked about David last week. But today, and the point of that lead up in many ways to help us understand that we, too, are extraordinary. God created us to be extraordinary. So I have just one simple idea today. The sermon in a sentence is this. God created me extraordinary. Somebody say that with me, please. God created me extraordinary. Let's do it again. God created me extraordinary. Anybody believe that? Extraordinary. I think one of the issues and one of the challenges that we have, and everybody kind of wrestles with the questions, right? Who am I? Where do I fit? Where do I belong? And what's my purpose? And so before we can answer that question, I believe that we have to believe as citizens of the kingdom of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, that God created us. And notice I didn't even say to be extraordinary. He created us extraordinary. Like we came out the shoot extraordinary. Amazing. Anybody ever seen a baby being born? Anybody ever watched that show? It is unbelievable. You're standing there and, 
And then boom, you're like, oh my goodness. And the word, the only word that fits is miracle. And God created us. Listen, the probability that when, say this right, recording, there's no baby. But when, let me see, when a man releases, we're talking about millions of sperm, just one egg. The probability that the egg is going to connect with that sperm and create a baby is virtually zero. Odds are super low. And so the fact that that happened is unbelievable. But when that miracle happens, it is because God is creating something extraordinary or someone extraordinary. God created me extraordinary. Let's look at, look at Psalm 139. I'm loving uh, our time together in the Psalms, hearing David talk about life, cry, complain, wish hateful stuff on his enemies, all kind of, man, David is like, get him, God, kill him, God, let it rain and let their nose turn upside down and let them drown, God. David is a rough dude, man. I love it, though. Anyway, David was gangster like me. All right, Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16. Watch this. For you created my inmost being. He's talking to the Lord like, God, you created. You did the work. The creator of the universe. He says, you focused on me. You created my inmost being. You knit me together. Right? You put in the work. The visual is like, God is doing the work. He's putting you, he's weaving you. He has some needles away. He's putting you together. Put me together in my mother's room. I praise you because what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Do people know who you are? Do you know who you are? I mean, when, when, when you were, you know, back when you were younger and, and folks were trying to holler at you, did you say, do you know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? Is that what you, like, do you understand who you're talking to? Do you realize how important, how valuable, how significant I am? It says God put me together. He wove me together himself. And because of that, I am fearfully. I am to be awed. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. I appreciate who you made me to be. If you absorb this and you understand who God created and made you to be, your esteem must be elevated. Your value, your worth, your sense of being and belonging, it has to go through because we're talking about God here. Not your parents, right? Not they just decided, but God decided to weave me together. It gets deeper. Watch this. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. It's like, God, you saw what was going on. When sperm and egg met, when conception took place, you were present. You participated in that. And I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. My unformed, my undeveloped, my yet-to-be-developed body. He's saying, God, you saw that. You were there. You created me wonderfully, powerfully. I'm valuable, I'm important, I'm significant. All your days were ordained for me. They were written in your book before one of them came to be. God had you in mind long before you showed up. God had a plan for your life before you existed. And I think the nature of sin, if you look at what happened in the garden, Satan's mission was to abort the mission that Adam and Eve were on to do what? To make earth more like heaven. To make the earth a colony of the kingdom of heaven. And so Satan tries to deceive us. And so many of us, the things that happened to us when we were younger, the things that are happening even today, is to keep you from being who God created you and designed you to be. You think the enemy, if he knew who you were, or perhaps he does know, if we knew who we were, and we pursued that path, we would destroy the enemy's work. That's why Christ said he came. And so the problem is for the enemy that if we realize who God created us to be, and if we do what he made us to do, it would spell doom for the devil's work. And so Satan's mission is to keep you from being successful and accomplishing the purpose for which God created you. Right? That, that teacher who discouraged you, trying to push you off me. Let's go back to David, his father, eight brothers. He says, surely the oldest one's supposed to be the king. 
No? All right. Number seven has got to be the king. Not him. Number got to be number six. And they go all the way down. And Samuel says, do you have another one? Oh, yeah, there's the pipsqueak, the, the runt out there with the sheep. You want me to call him? Like, sheesh, right? Didn't believe that David was the king. Because he's little Davy Dave. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I mean? You like, you don't. Be me family. Oh, that's just so-and-so. God had designed from the beginning of time for David to be the king. No recognition. None. Even Samuel, he's like, it's the big guy, right? No, nope. uh-uh. Same thing with his brother, right? David, why are you even here? Same thing with the king, Saul. What, what are you doing, little boy? You know how big Goliath is? Like, man, everybody see how big Goliath was, is. Y'all scared of him? I'm not. But what happened? He says, I'm trying to dissuade you. Because he says, you can the king told the dude, you cannot beat him. If you're going to go out there and put on my stuff, I don't keep wearing somebody else's clothes to do anything. That doesn't make any sense, right? Put on my shoes to go run this track. You got a size 8, I'm a 12. I'm going to go out there and get hurt fooling with your shoes. Why would I put your stuff on? But everybody's trying to dissuade him from accomplishing the purpose that God had laid in his heart, and that was to destroy the giant. And so the negative things that have happened in our lives come from the enemy to destroy us or God giving us an opportunity to realize who we are. David, lion, coming at his, his sheep. Some of us will be like, the devil is attacking me. God is like, dude, I'm preparing you so when you have to face Goliath, you won't be the least bit concerned. He handles the lion. Kills the lion, he said. I said to y'all before, right, lions and bears don't converse. Word hadn't gotten out about little Davy Day. <laughs> Bear comes up. He didn't look over to the side, the little lion carcass over there. <laughs> he didn't ask, what's the lion bones doing over there? He like, <laughs> last one to try to mess with my sheep, bruh. He comes up. And so by the time David has to deal with Goliath, he's like, bruh, what did he say? He's like, I kill lions and bears. Big people don't bother me at all. Like, this is breakfast. What's for lunch? You see what I'm saying? Because God had allowed him to experience the lion and the bear to be able to handle the giant. And so God created us, made us uniquely, prepared us for a purpose. The enemy's job is to try to thwart that mission. And so I want us this week, this life, to say that God created me extraordinary. When you look in the mirror, tell yourself, you know what? God created me extraordinary. God created me. I believe that with all of my heart. God created me extraordinary. My mama did a good job. Then she passed the baton to my wife. She didn't do a good job. It got me believing I'm extraordinary. And then I see in the word that I am, in fact, extraordinary. And we have to, as people, tell each other. That's the person next to you. Say, you know what? You're extraordinary. Tell the little baby, baby, you extraordinary. <laughs> if the baby understood she was extraordinary, is it she or he? He, she, the baby. The baby understood. <laughs> By the time they got to your age, my age, the baby would be unstoppable. Why? Because think about it. Every day in your life, somebody say, you're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. That felt good when they said that to you, didn't it? I saw everybody's mask go up. Y'all was like, really? <laughs> For real? But if we make that a practice and we realize that God has made us extraordinary, everything will be changed. Let me show you something. Anybody old enough remember the Yugo? Yugo, $39.99. <laughs> Anybody have a Yugo? You had one? <laughs> Where's the mic? I'm going to let you give a testimony on your Yugo. <laughs> I, know, I know you got stories. Listen, you go 1.3 liter engine, same size on my uh, lawnmower. <laughs> 44 horsepower. What, zero to 60 in 21 seconds. I can get to zero to 60 in 21 seconds on a bike. Listen, this car was raggedy. Prototyped in 1977, stayed on the market till 2008. Unbelievable. They made 7, 794,428 2040s cars. 
Then did I tell you? <laughs> you good. So, no, no, you out there now. You know, people that seen it. Go ahead. Listen, so this was a book written about the car, The Rise and Fall of the Worst Car in History. I, re I distinctly remember reading U.S. News, not U.S. News, was, um, what's the, the rate the cars? Um, Consumer Reports. They're like, this is the first time we've ever recommended buying any used car over a new car, but do not buy this vehicle. This car was raggedy, right? The doors felt like plastic. I was at the Detroit Auto Show the first time I saw one of these things, and this guy's like, hey, brother, you can get those big bazooka speakers and put this in the back, and it would just be amazing. I'm like, dude, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I can read. I will, what I'm not gonna do is buy no you go, right? You go to the dealership, you go to the junkyard, raggedy piece of car, unbelievable, and they sold this thing, and like I said, the book was, now, let's look at the next one. 1955 Mercedes-Benz, $143 million. This was May of 2022. <laughs> Made him call on Jesus, right? I need to get me one of them, right? Y'all gonna buy me one? <laughs> With my Movado, y'all gonna buy me one of them? Listen, $143 million. There are only two of these made. Mercedes owned both of them. They, they uh, auctioned this one off for some for $143 million to do something with. 104 handmade, individually crafted. Do you understand? You see where I'm going with this, right? If you see yourself like a Yugo, you will behave like a Yugo, act like a Yugo, talk like a Yugo, and end up at, break down like a Yugo, and end up in the junkyard like a Yugo all 794,000 of them. But if you understand that you are a 1955 Mercedes 300 SL, wouldn't you drive these two cars differently? <laughs> See what I'm saying? He said, you got that right. And you would let people ride in them differently too, wouldn't you? You'd be like, you weren't fit to get in my car, were you? I'm sorry, mama, but uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mud on the shoes, the dog wouldn't be in there, the kids wouldn't be in there, wouldn't nobody be in there, right? You'd be putting on your little suit to get in the car. $143 million, two of them in the world, handmade, custom. And so do you have a Yugo mindset about yourself? Or do you have, do you have? You have the 1955 Benz mindset. This is what I want to convey to us. I want us thinking 1955 Mercedes. That is who I am. That is who God created me, be, me to be. I'm individually handcrafted, woven together by his hand. I'm not an accident, not a oops, not a how did that happen. I'm an intentional creation of the creator of the universe, and I am extraordinary. Wow. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26a and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God created man in his image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so this notion of being created in the image and likeness of God, we have a personality, we have will, we have emotion. We have the ability to create. That's why we have to be careful what we say. We have creative power in our words. The Bible says what? The power of life and death is in the tongue. Right? And what's the next part of it? Right? He says, we will create our reality. We create through our words because our words impact our thinking. Our thinking impacts our emotions. Our emotions impact our behavior, and our behavior determines the outcomes of our life. I was talking to a friend of mine. He's an uh, epidemiologist. Uh, what was it, Hopkins? Now he's at uh, Tulane. 
And he says, um, he's, listen, he was in, talking to these, uh, these women about the issue of diabetes. And the woman's like, well, let me get these, these cute shoes because I'm going to end up getting my foot cut off anyway. And so it's like, this woman doesn't have diabetes yet, but she's waving the flag <laughs> on having diabetes and having to lose limbs. And these are the words coming out of this person's mouth. And so if these are the beliefs you have, and even if the doctor says to you, hey, cut back on these particular kind of food, this, that, and the other, if your belief is that it does not matter, then you will behave accordingly. Isn't that frightening? Or when you say to your own little child, you're stupid. You're dumb. You're not going to be anything. You're not going to do anything. And this is your child? Just going to live in your house till they're 59, 80 years old? Are you kidding me? And so you're literally cursing yourself through your words based upon your beliefs. And so this scripture is so powerful because God said, let us make man in our image. Let's make him like us, like mankind, male and female like us. We have, the, we have morality. We have the, the thought between good and bad. We can make decisions, right? We can speak life to people who don't have life themselves. We have the ability to control ourselves. We can master ourselves. You realize that? The cake, the pie, the cookies, the chicken, it does not have the power to master us unless we give it to it. And then because we're citizens of the kingdom, we also have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to master our appetite. Amen. And to say, I'm not going to do that or I'm going to do this. I'm going to take better care of my machine. I'm going to exercise, I'm going to eat right, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to take care of my body temple. We have the ability because why? We're like God. He made us in his image and his likeness. And he gave us our name. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. This is the book of the generations of Adam. On the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them and he named them mankind. On the day that they were created, he named them. He named us. And so we talked about this a few months ago. This is a big deal, name, image, and likeness. And so, update. So, student athletes, NCAA rules now that students can actually be paid for their name, their image, and their likeness, right? So, kids, name on the jersey, the pictures, the, you know, they got uh, the avatars. And so, social media is blown up. These kids who are probably going to drop out of school are like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I can make a couple of dollars being in school. So, you have these 18, 19 year olds being paid to uh, promote products and so forth because now no longer is it just the university that benefit from their name, their image, and their likeness. And so, again, the, the lesson here is we're named by, we have the image of and the likeness of the creator of the universe. Let's say God created me. Extraordinary. God created me extraordinary. And so we have the name, the image, and the likeness of the creator of the universe. And so these two young men, uh, the young man on the left, Thomas Gunther, the young man on the right, Nick Billups, they were walk-ins, walk-ons for BYU, Brigham Young University football. Uh, Gunther, the gentleman on the left, he had just gotten married, has a one-year-old child, now, as a walk-on, what that essentially means is you don't what? You don't have a scholarship, <laughs> right? We let you on the team, but you kind of, by definition, scrub status. So you're good enough to be on, but you're going to have to pay for yourself, right? And so what we're going to see in a minute is their entire lives were transformed by the name, image, and likeness ruling the NCAA. So, watch this. Every day I'm on the street and I see the gun violence that's plaguing our community. I know how big of a job no, it's going to Oh, see, oh, the commercial. <laughs> Let the YouTube commercial play through, and then we hit skip and go ahead. Tell me, hero, are you a walk-on? <clears throat> you know what I love about this guy? This guy's a fighter. I over 
technology myself. Tell me, you're a, are you a walk-on? <coughs> you know what I love about this guy? This guy's a fighter. I heard a story. Dude, I got goosebumps when I talked about, this guy's not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but he's like, I feel something different. I want to be part of this team. He met some of you guys, and he's like, I feel something special. I want to be like you. I want to be part of you. And he just said, I feel like I'm part of something. Nick. Bill, we want you to be employee number one. We want to pay for your tuition. A walk on that's been busting his butt here a long time is Thomas Gunther. Where is he? Coach, we want you to be employee number two, and we want to pay for your tuition. Yeah. That's what we want to do. All walk on, step up. Oh, no. oh, hey. oh, oh, oh. You know what? Employees one through 36 in the house. So these, these kids promoting energy bars, of all things, right? <laughs> energy bars, 36 of them receiving full tuition scholarships because of the name, image, and likeness. So just imagine, when you bear the name, the image, and the likeness of the creator of the universe, you're extraordinary. You're extraordinary. And so what God is desirous and willing to do when we realize who we are, when we understand what he's done for us, and in spite of our sins, in spite of our faults and our failures, God, like this guy, energy bar guy, right? He's like, all y'all scrubs, stand up. <laughs> You're not scrubs. You have a scholarship just like everybody else in the room. And so God says to us in our last couple of verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork. And I'll read it in the Amplify in a minute. But we're God's handiwork, created. God created me, extraordinary, in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, God had a plan for our life from our mother's womb. He had a mission. He had an assignment. We have an enemy who desires to thwart that. But when we realize who we are, and it doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to build a business or whatever. People talk about now uh, quiet quitting. I'm like, okay, quiet. You might quit quietly and you get fired out loud. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> They're like, well, you know, don't. And I get it. Listen, I don't think anybody should stay at a job where you hate the job. You can't do a God. You can't stand it. Go somewhere. But as a citizen of the kingdom of God, discover, ask God, God, where do you want me to be? Amen. What do you want me to do? When I look back over my history, and we'll talk about this in another couple weeks, talk about God has shaped me to be extraordinary. He's given me the spiritual gifts, the heart, the ability, the personality, the experiences to be extraordinary. Right? The passion. I, my favorite question I ask people that I meet, what are you passionate about? And it's interesting to watch people's eyes light up. And oftentimes it's so different than what they're doing, right? You see a person doing, they're working the job, and you're like, what are you passionate about? We heard Darren, he said he'd been in the job for 20 years. He was doing maintenance stuff. Nothing wrong with that. If that's your call, your mission assignment, that's fantastic. But he, you heard him on the video. I hated it. 
We can't get up every day. When God has something significant for us to do and have to hate it. God desires you to be fulfilled, man. To love what you do. To get up, I heard a guy guy saying it didn't make any sense until we got a dog. He said, get up in the morning with your tail wagging. Right? My dog is excited. Ooh, I said my dog. This is getting bad. The dog, my wife's dog. All right, it's my dog. Whatever. The dog gets up with the tail wagging. Eat, like the dog eats this designer food. The dog just got the life, man. People are like, oh, your dog, the coat is so jet black. It's like if you was eating like the dog and then took naps all day and people played with you, guess what? You'd be shiny too. Right, but if we understand who God created us to be, and there's nothing more beautiful. Again, the thing I love about Own Our when you see somebody take an idea and they create this thing and it just blossoms and the joy. Now they work harder than they've ever worked before, so it's not about hard work. But the idea of getting to do what God created me to do. Right? I pass out every night. <laughs> Sleep is not a problem. But I get to do much of the day, whether it's church stuff, whether it's university stuff, whether it's community stuff. And see, that's the thing, too. We have to get beyond this idea that ministry is constrained to church. Now, don't get it twisted. I want you to do stuff in church. (laughs) But that's just a piece of the thing, man. God has created you to impact the world. We call it having a kingdom worldview, right? The kingdom of God. He says, have dominion over the earth. Have rule. Make the earth a colony of heaven. He's created and designed each of us. And so there's some piece of that over which you're supposed to exercise dominion. So whether it's cleaning stuff, whether it's websites, whether it's it's, it's, uh, uh, um, exercise, whether it's an, an app for pain treatment, whether it doesn't matter. It could be flowers. Right? The things, the businesses, Mary Kay, I don't care. If you like people's face looking better, <laughs> my wife went somewhere, she's getting a, 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 um, getting a face or something, they're like, what do you? She's like, Mary Kay, they're like, mm. <laughs> haters gonna hate. Mary Kay work. Good black don't crack. It is what it is. But if that's what you do, do that. But do the thing that God created you to do. Get up in the morning excited about life. Until you're dead, you're not retired, not in the kingdom. There is no retirement putting your feet up in the kingdom. No. As long as you have breath, you flat on your back, paralyzed, put the phone up to my face so I can call somebody. You're extraordinary. God has so much for us. So let's look at what the Amplifier says. For we are his workmanship, his masterwork, his work of art. Your masterpiece, your 1955, 300 SL, $143 million, only two created and only one of them exists. That's you. Created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used. When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we are born again. Our assignment is re-given. Our mission is fixed. And we have the ability to accomplish the purpose that God created for, which he prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we could walk, would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. God created me extraordinary. And guess what? You too. If you never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Or perhaps you didn't know that God created you extraordinary. I really, really, was simple one little thing this week. If every day you can say to yourself, God created me extraordinary. In your own hearing. And maybe record it on your phone. Play it back to yourself. Because those messages that have been placed in your head that you put there or somebody else put there, there's a lot of them. And you need to displace those messages with what God says, with what he says. So every time a negative message comes, you need some more. No, 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 Satan, God created me extraordinary. God created me extraordinary. God created me extraordinary. And so I want you this week to 
Tell yourself over and over and as many times as you need that God created you extraordinary. When you run up against a difficulty this week, and it seems like it's a little overwhelming, say, you know what? Hmm, God created me extraordinary. God is allowing this difficult in my, difficulty in my life to stretch me, to prepare me, to grow me, to build my confidence. And so, God, I thank you. Right? When you exercise or when you have a trainer or when you go to the gym or when you're a, a sport and you have a coach, they push you to make you stronger, to prepare you. And so, God, I believe that if you allow it to happen, according to your word, all things, all things, you orchestrate them for my good, even if I don't like them, even if it doesn't feel good. God, you're working it out for my good. And so, God, because you created me extraordinary, I'm going to do extraordinary things to advance the kingdom of God. And in the process, my family will be blessed. My children will be blessed. My faith community will be blessed. My workplace will be blessed. We're supposed to be a blessing in our workplace. When you come in the door, it's like the kingdom is here. The ambassador of the kingdom of God has just arrived and the kingdom influence is going to expand in this place. Prophets will go up or I'll leave because I've given a better opportunity. I say to my kids, listen, you apply for a job, you do something, is that or something better? Like I'm going to do this or something better. Why? Because you're extraordinary. And so today, if you never surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the enemy is keeping you from recognizing that you're extraordinary. But the scripture says if we will surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, say Jesus is Lord, declare treason against the kingdom of darkness. Jesus is Lord. I turn my back on my old life and I give my life to the Lord. Use me as he chooses. Confess with mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, the impossible. You see, it's interesting. This is a true miracle because typically in the world, God uses people. You know, this is because why? He says the earth is the Lord, the fullness of the but he's given us dominion over the earth. And so God asks for us to intervene typically when he does anything in the world. That's why we pray. And so the fact that Jesus was resurrected without any human intervention, that's a miracle. No person prayed. Nobody fasted. God, through his own power, raised Jesus from the dead. He says, and that's, you know, but he says, if you buy that, you believe that Christ lives, you can be rescued from the power and the dominion of sin and Satan in your life. For those of us who are saved, but we've been beat down by life, remind yourself, you know what? God created me extraordinary. So today, let that become the mantra of your life. And we'll go on in the coming weeks and see the implications of being created extraordinary. But that's the base. That's the foundation. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that everyone in this room and those who are online and those who even will see this message in the future, that something will change in their spirit. Lord God, the truth of your scriptures will resonate with their hearts, Lord God, and that they will recognize, realize, and then speak out of their mouths. God created me extraordinary. So, Father, I thank you. I believe that today's message is going to be transformational for somebody. Someone who's going to hear, receive, chew on, and repeat these words over and over again based on the truth of your word. So, Father, I thank you for what you're going to do. Look, God, as we prepare to launch a new school year, as we speak to our children, you're extraordinary because God created you that way. As we speak to the young people in our out-of-school time work, oh God, as we begin again to pray around our community, oh God, people who are living lives far beneath your plan for them, oh God, those who are on drugs, those who are in gangs, those, oh God, who because they don't know that you created them extraordinary, oh God, are looking to and turning toward all kinds of other addictions. Father, we thank you. We receive today, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we are, because of you, we are created extraordinary. And so, Father, I give you thanksgiving, I give you praise, I give you honor. And I pray this prayer now in the name, the power, and the authority.
authority of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God that God created me. Extraordinary. I think we're... No announcement? Everybody's good? Let's stay. Father, we pray your blessing over your people. God, I ask that you use them mightily this week as they realize that they're extraordinary. And Lord God, we thank you because we expect many testimonies of the power of the truth of your word in our lives as we live lives that are honoring you and that are extraordinary with extraordinary outcome and extraordinary impact for the kingdom of God. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell the person on your left and your right, tell them you are extraordinary. You are extraordinary. <laughs> and my pastor loves you. <laughs> God bless you. Have an amazing rest of your day. <laughs>